If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13 to 20. If you don't have your Bibles, you can look at the screen. But if you have your Bibles, it'll be good to open up to Hebrews 6, 13 to 20. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. You know, in our growing up years, we've all done this at some time or the other. You get into a debate with your friend, and your friend doesn't believe you. And so the next thing you say, I swear, I swear, I promise, I swear. And then the friend doesn't believe you. I swear on my head and you'll touch your head or you'll touch your throat. And then that's not convincing. I swear my father and mother. And then the friend is convinced. How many of you have done that? Put your hands up in the press. We've all done that. Just to convince the other person that uh, you're absolutely sure that you don't mind even swearing on your father and mother's head on their lives. Because you're going to keep your word and fulfill the promise that you have made. Once you have done that, something happens. You settle every argument. You settle that sense of doubt in the other person. Now look at what God is doing to Abraham. God made a promise to Abraham and then he said, Because he could not swear by anyone greater, there was no one greater than God. So he said, I swear by myself, saying, Surely I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply. And he makes this solid oath towards Abraham. God surely wants to bless you. God has sworn to bless his people. And then it goes on to say in verse 15, Abraham patiently endured, and then he obtained the promise. Some of you have had promises over your life. You've had promises that you've held on to and nothing has happened. But there is something that we can learn from Abraham where he patiently endured long suffering in order for the promise to be made good and God swore. And you can understand Abraham's situation. He waited patiently for the promised child. Year in and year out, nothing happened. And in order for God to reassure him, God swore and said, Surely I will bless you, and in multiplying, I will multiply you. And that's a very reassuring word for all of us as we read this passage of scripture. Because it goes on to say in verse 16, For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. It, it ends the argument whether God is going to bless you or not. God's surely going to bless you. Can you say that after me? God is surely going to bless me. God swore that I will be, a bl I will be blessed. How many of you believe that? Now God swore that and it ends the dispute, it ends doubt, it ends unbelief because God swore and then it goes on to say Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise. Who's the heirs of the promise? Every one of us are heirs of the promise that God made to Abraham. So what God swore to Abraham, he also swore to us because we are in the line of Abraham. And it says, to make sure more abundantly to the heirs of all of us, the promise, the immutability of his counsel conformed by an oath. The word immutability means unchanging over time. So the oath is not only good for Abraham, it's good for us as heirs of Abraham. What God swore to him, he swore to us. And God saying, surely I will bless you, and in multiplying, I will multiply you. It goes on to say, in which it is impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation. Now, I missed out something here. Verse 18. We'll go back to verse 18. 
that by two immutable things in which is impossible for God to lie. Two immutable, two unchanging things, it's impossible for God to lie. What are the two things? God's character and God's word. God's character is unchanging. His word is unchanging. His word is his character. God will uphold his word at any cost. That's why Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. And God's word is saying, by this immutable things, his word and his character, it is impossible for God to lie. We have strong consolation. And I trust this morning, we are comforted. The word consolation is comfort. We are comforted with the fact that God has sworn over our lives that we will be a blessed people. How many of you are blessed this morning? I want you to lift your hands and thank God. And thank God and say, God, you have sworn. Not only to Abraham, to every one of us. I am your seed, Lord. I am the seed of Abraham. Lift your voice and thank God and say, Lord, I believe, Lord. But these two immutable things, I am strengthened in my faith. Thank him for it. It goes on to say, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. We've all fled the world and the past bondage in order to lay hold of the hope of what God has promised us. It goes on in verse 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, talking about our hope and our faith, and which enters the presence behind the veil. Now this hope is anchored not only in a promise but in a person. A person that's passed behind the veil. Who's the person? Who's the person? Jesus. And it says that in verse 20, where the forerunner, Jesus went ahead of us, has entered for us. Can we say for us? Jesus is there in heaven interceding for us. <clears throat> when Jesus came to the earth, he came with one mission to reveal God to mankind. Jesus ascended into heaven to reveal the heart and the hardships of man to God. Can you see the dual role that Jesus played? When he was on earth, he was, it was to, his duty was to bring a revelation of God. Now he's in heaven, he presents the needs of man. He represents us in heaven. And the Bible says that he's a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. What a blessing. Our hope is not anchored in our religion. Our hope is not anchored in what we do. Our hope is anchored in what God swore and in Jesus who makes it good for us. Now that's good Bible teaching. Because so often we think we have not worked enough in order to inherit the promise. Or we're not good enough in order to lay hold of the promise. It has nothing to do with your goodness. It has all to do with God's immutable character. His word and himself. He swore that we would be a blessing. And Jesus goes as our forerunner into heaven. So that our faith is anchored in Jesus to make good what God has sworn. It can't get better than that. Now, all of this sounds very nice. And you must be thinking, well, if God swore a blessing over my life, you should only know what I'm going through. And sometimes there's a huge gap between what God says and what we're experiencing. On day-to-day -day reality, we're struggling with finances. We're struggling with other unresolved issues. So how do we bridge the gap? How do we apply this truth? Now, there is something that I would like to draw your attention to. The blessing that God spoke over Abraham and his heirs had to do with both the physical as well as the spiritual. And that's why I'm quoting that verse which says, Surely I will bless you and I will multiply you and your descendants as the stars of the, uh, in the sky. That's the promise. We are physical beings. And we are also spiritual beings. 
God wants to bless us in this physical world. He also wants to bless us in the spiritual world. And I notice that most of us run after the physical blessing. And we set our goal on being blessed materially. Now if you look at Abraham's life, he never left his country searching for material, material blessings. He was searching for God. He was searching for a city that was established on godly principles and godly values. His heart was set on God. And as he pursued after God and followed, started following the voice of God, God blessed him and said, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing to the nations. Now here's the secret. You ready for the secret? When you set your heart on the spiritual goal, the material blessings will also follow. follow. Is that true? You will not be able to contain the blessing when we prioritize what we are seeking for. Solomon is a good example. God appeared to him in, at night. And uh, this angel asked Solomon, what do you want? Make your prayer request. What did he ask for? Did he ask for money? Wives? No. He asked for one thing. Give me wisdom. And God said to Solomon, because you've asked for a good thing, I will not only give you wisdom, I will bless you. And God made him a point of reference in his time that the people and around, that, around them, in that other nations, looked up to Solomon as the most wealthy, the most prosperous, and the most wise man. Why? Because he asked the right prayer. And some of us are missing out because we are asking for the wrong things. We're seeking for the wrong things. That's why Jesus had to come and remind us, seek ye first the kingdom. Because we're all seeking for something or the other. You're either seeking for a wife, or seeking for a job, or seeking for a house, or always seeking for something. Man, by nature, is a seeker. And you ask yourself, what are you seeking for? You will find out there's subtly an ambition that's rising in your heart, which you're seeking after. And God is saying, seek ye first. Among all the things that you're seeking, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and everything else will be added to you. And everything else means the physical blessing will also be added to you. Now, we get a lot of prayer requests and people come for prayer and especially couples if they're married and they say, you know, we want to start a family but, you know, uh, I pray that we will have kids and, and uh, you know, God will bless us. And four years, five years, six years, they get so impatient, they run from one place to another place because they want to start a family and nothing seems to be happening. They go from one hospital to another hospital. They try all uh, kind of medication in order for, for, for them to start a family or how to conceive. And there is a restlessness growing in the heart of the man and the woman because they desperately want to produce a natural child. Because it's natural for them to have children. God designed us like that. But I hardly have anyone being restless or being spiritually barren. Are you listening to me? And they take their barrenness. Ah, oh, that's not my calling. And the time you got saved, you've never seen anyone else saved in your life. And it doesn't bother you. Do you know you're sick? You need treatment. Because God promised Abraham not only physical blessing. He says, I will surely bless you and make you a father of many nations. He will bless us spiritually. And that we will bring forth spiritual sons and daughters into the kingdom of God. Who will be called the descendants of Abraham. Somebody shout an amen. You see what? We don't seek that. We seek everything else that Abraham. He, we want to be the head and not the tail. Above and not beneath. Everything we put our hands to. We know it. We can rattle those blessings. But remember, 
God said to Abraham, surely in multiplying, I will multiply you and make your descendants as the stars in the sky. When last you sought God for spiritual sons and daughters? When last did we see God and God desperately hungry and saying, God, I will go for prayer. I will attend any seminar. I will read your word. I will do anything. But God, I want to see the seed of Abraham being multiplied through my life. Is that making sense to us this morning? You see, when you set your heart on that and start seeking God, every blessing that God pronounced on Abraham will come to you. And I found that that's the secret behind the blessings of Abraham. If we as a church can only believe what God has sworn over our lives, what, is, what God has sworn towards each and every one of us, of God blessing us and God multiplying the descendants through us, only believe and trust God, we will see a far number of people come into the kingdom of God. We will see the descendants of Abraham multiplied. Why? Because God, by two immutable things, his character and his word, he will keep what he has promised. And you can believe God for your loved ones. You can believe God for your neighborhood. You can believe God for your family. Why? Because God swore that they will be, uh, you know, the descendants of Abraham. He saved you to save other people. That's making sense to you? You know, sometimes we can get so happy sitting on our blessed assurance and saying, Jesus is mine. No, he's others also. Not just yours. And we get comfortable with this whole aspect of spiritual barrenness. We want every, we will fast and pray for the other blessings of Abraham. But when it comes to the spiritual side, we conveniently bypass it not knowing that God has called us not only to physically reproduce, He's called us spiritually to reproduce His life into other people. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 2 verse 8, Ask of me, and I will give you nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possessions. God is saying, ask of me. Not for a bigger house, a bigger car, or more money, a bigger uh, salary. He says, ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, our inheritance. That's our spiritual inheritance. And the ends of the earth for your possession, all he wants us to do is to come into a place of asking and saying, God, I trust you for what you've sworn. Can you please say this after me? God has blessed me to bless other people. God has blessed me to bless others. Tell someone next to you, God blesses you to bless others. Tell someone, God saved you to save others. God heals you to heal others. You see, that's the heart of the gospel. The blessings were never to be stagnated in, in one person. The blessing uh, God chose was to be distributed and see that his descendants will get the blessing that came to you. And thank God that Abraham was not selfish with him and his family. He carried on believing God for the descendants, his descendants to be multiplied. So we're not only children of God, we're also the children of Abraham. By faith. That's why patience, everything that we obtain from God, comes through faith and patience. We are so impatient in this modern world. We can't wait you stand in a queue, we can't stand for too long in the queue. We'll cut the queue or we'll go try online something. Everything now is online. We want it fast, we want it quick. And so now when we come to God and His promises, we're impatient and our impatience costs us the blessing and the outworking of God. Patience works character in us. True faith will always be generated and demonstrated by patience. If you bypass patience, you bypass faith. Faith and patience go together. 
Because in our waiting period, God is working on the inside of us. God is doing something far more significant than what our natural eyes can't see. So we have a picture of God. We have a picture of the heart of God. We understand that this is what God has sworn, that we will be a blessed people on this earth, and God will multiply the descendants of Abraham through us. Are we convinced about that? Are you happy about that? Ah, I'm not hearing a good response. Are you happy about that? Yeah. And so we can be assured God will keep his side of the bargain and say, God, now use me to keep my side of the bargain. So there's a common question that people ask in the church. What's my ministry? I want to hear my ministry. I want you to prophesy what my ministry. How many of you want to know what your ministry is? Can I see your hand? You want to know what your ministry is? I'm going to reveal what your ministry is. Are you happy? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ. Now, there's a whole lot of messages on that. We will look at it later from uh, January onwards. But if anyone is in Christ, something happens. You're a new creation. Your desire for sin changes. Your perspective changes. And it says, all things are passed away. Behold, look, all, all things have become new. That means, not only your destiny changes, your purpose in life changes. Most of us who receive Christ as our Savior, we know our destiny is, is changed, our destination has changed. But we are not willing to change our purpose. Our purpose also becomes brand new. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I want to press on to find out why God took a hold of my life. He was spiritually seeking for a purpose of why God saved him. And that should be our heart. Why did God save you and not someone else? Why didn't God bypass you? Because there was a purpose. All things have become new. Even your purpose and existence in this world has become new. And then it goes on to say in verse 18. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us. Who is he given? Who is he given? Ask the ministry of reconciliation. What's your ministry? What's your ministry? You're willing to accept your ministry? So please don't say, God, I never knew what my ministry is. This is your ministry. It's a ministry of reconciliation. Now look at what that verse says. He has first reconciled us to himself. So you go through the experience of being reconciled to God and then he puts in your hand the ministry of reconciliation to others. So uh, you can print your visiting card. You have a ministry. What's your ministry? And if anyone asks you what you're doing, you can pass it on. This is my ministry. But you know, hold on. More than knowing what your ministry, you also got a designation. And this designation is not pastor, prophet and evangelist. Look at this designation. He has called us ambassadors for Christ. You are an ambassador. So you can put that on your visiting card. That carries more weight. I'm an ambassador and I'm reconciling a lost world to God. How you like that for a mandate? That's our purpose. That's why you exist as a Christian. That's why God touched you. Because God knew that you're in a circle of friends. You're in a company that no one else can touch except through you. And so he chose you for that purpose. Yes, he loved you, but he loves others also. And he uses you to touch other people. And so he's given us a ministry of reconciliation. And then he calls us ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you, we beg you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. 
uh, the Apostle Paul took his ministry seriously. Wherever he went, wherever he traveled, he, had, he traveled as an ambassador for God. You know, now it's only in the recent years they have come up with this uh, tag. Everyone who goes to a company will get one tag. Yeah, you wear it around and some of you don't like it, you push it inside your shirt. But you know why you got a tag? To tell everyone you represent IBM. To tell everyone this is what you represent. And you carry that tag and some of you are so proud of it, you show it off. You know, I'm a manager that's working in this company. I want to tell you, uh, God has called you an ambassador and we must carry that tag in our heart. And we must own that tag. Not be ashamed of it. You are a significant person in this world. God has anointed you. God has called you to be his ambassador for Christ. Because reconciliation is the heart of God. That's the purpose of God. That's what God swore over your life. Not only to bless you physically and materially. He swore that through you the descendants of Abraham will be multiplied. And so whatever profession you are in. Whatever you're called to do, wherever you are placed, remember you represent a God as an ambassador for Christ. And your ministry is to bring reconciliation. So what does the word reconciliation mean? It's a very important word in the Bible. It means to settle one's differences. Settle differences. Make up. Kiss one another. Be friendly once again. Now, if you're married, you know what reconciliation means. And even if you're single, you've always had friends who will turn their back on you, or you say something, you are, get, you are upset with them, and uh, they don't talk to you. And you're feeling, you know, you're a Christian, you know, you should take the first step and apologize, and so you, you, you encourage yourself, and you go meet someone. And you're saying, look, I'm so sorry, yeah, I've offended you. And what are you looking for? You're looking for reconciliation. You're looking that now you will kiss and make up. Or, or maybe, you know, drop the fence that between you all. Settle those differences and be together in friendship. Isn't that true? Now, I also said husband and wife because, you know, in husband and wife we have these things. If you're not married, you will get to know what I'm talking about. Sooner or later, you, we have these cold wars. You know, how many of you know what a cold war is? That means when you sleep, she sleeps and faces that, that side of the wall, you sleep and face the side of the wall. Suddenly the walls become more interesting than each other. And as a result, there's a wall in between you all. And then you can't bear it. Either the husband can't bear it and the silence is killing him, or the wife can't, can't bear it, the silence is killing her. This tension with not communicating in just one word, two words, is too much to take because there's a division, there's a breakdown in relationship. And then one person, sometimes it's the man, sometimes it's the woman. I leave it up to you who it is, but one takes the initiative and says, Okay, if it makes you feel better, I am sorry. How many of you heard that in marriage? Put your hand up. Anyone heard that in marriage? Come on, don't let me be the only one here. Only walk it to. Yeah, good. Thank you so much. You got a ministry of comfort. Good. And you begin to think, what if it makes you feel better? In other words, hey, drop this offense. Drop the differences between us. Come on, smile again. Let's be happy together. Let's be reconciled. And that person takes the initiative. Why? Because they want to enjoy relationship with the other person. And now God is saying this. He, through his son Jesus, has reconciled the lost world to himself. Because God couldn't bear the separation between the world and God. That God says, I can't bear the silence and the breakdown of relationship between man and us. Jesus, would you go down, represent man, take on his punishment, take on that separation of sin and guilt, so that this world will be reconciled, kiss and make up, and enjoy harmony with one another. Come on, sir, you can do better than that. Shout an amen. amen. He has reconciled us. He has reconciled us to himself. Have you noticed one thing? He, he had to reconcile us to himself. He didn't reconcile himself to us. There's a difference. You know why? Because he never offended us. 
We were the ones who turned our back. We were the ones who said, you're too boring, let's get more exciting in life. And we walked away from God. But God took the initiative, identified with man, to reconcile us back to him. Some of you are still struggling to understand this ministry of reconciliation. But it's not something that we need to comprehend in our mind only. It's something for us to experience what it means to be reconciled, to be at peace with God. God loves you. And God desires to be in relationship with you. And God took that initiative in order that we would enjoy the harmony that we could have. Not only with one another, but also with Him. Jesus took our place in history, identified himself as a man, understood our suffering, understood our pain, understood our temptation as a man representing us for only one purpose, to stand in the gap between humanity and God and play a reconciliation role. Now we all know that the father of our nation is Mahatma Gandhi. Am I right? Anyone was born there at that time? I can't see anyone's hands up. Anyone met Mahatma Gandhi? No. But still we believe and we celebrate August 15 as our independence. How did you know? You read it, you were taught it, you believed it, and so now you enjoy August 15th as a holiday. I don't know how many of us even think of him on that August 15th, but you think of a holiday. Wow, one more holiday. And we wait for August 15th to come. But the reason why we have a holiday, because it happened in history. And we believe it, and that's why we celebrate independence. <clears throat> in the same way, it happened in history. Jesus did come. There is a real place in Jerusalem. Jesus died on that cross. He stood in our place. And we believe the history that's documented between AD and BC that signifies the death and the resurrection of Jesus for this one purpose that man and the entire world will be reconciled to him. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more. Can you say the word much more? Say it again, much more. So what is the Bible saying? When you were enemies, when we were hostile, disinterested in God, God still loved you, died for you, and reconciled us to God. When we were enemies... When the world was opposing God, God still provided reconciliation. Now, reconciliation is with two people. So, if I had a misunderstanding with someone, and I took the initiative and told the person, I'm sorry, please forgive me, you know, I was wrong, I should not have said that, I should not have done that. In order to make that reconciliation worthy or, or effective, it takes the other person to respond. Am I right? It's only when the person responds that the fulfillment of reconciliation comes to pass. And the rest relationship is restored. But if the person does not respond to my initiative, I'm no longer guilty. I've done my part, it's up to that person to receive the reconciliation and my forgiveness or reject my forgiveness and, uh, and my initiative. Why am I saying this? God has already reconciled the entire world to himself. He's reconciled the entire world to himself through his son Jesus. And now it's up to us to receive and respond to his reconciliation. And saying, God, you took that initiative. 
And I receive it. I respond. And I say, God, I'm going to drop all my anger. I'm going to drop all my, my, my disappointments that I held you responsible for. And I'm going to make up and be one with you and enjoy fellowship. That's when the reconciliation of God becomes a reality in our life. And I'm going to read on. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Reconciliation and salvation are two separate things. God reconciled a broken world to Himself, but when the world responds to His reconciliation, receives what God's forgiveness is towards us, we get saved. And that's how you and I got saved. We responded to God's initiative of being reconciled. We didn't contribute to it. We didn't deserve it. God did it because He loved us. We respond to His reconciliation. As a result, we receive His forgiveness. God is an extremely loving God. And it's hard to think that even ISIS and cold murderers who, who walk into buildings and shoot and execute, God still loves them. And if they could only recognize the love of God and, and the, the reconciliation that God has already, already, already provided for them, and they could reach out and receive it, they would be Saul's turned into Paul. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so God is anxiously waiting for a world to respond to the message of reconciliation. That's why Jesus came. That's why he's given us a ministry of reconciliation. Because this is the heartbeat of God. For the world to say yes to God. And receive what he has given to us. If we can do that for us as enemies... How much more we should take advantage of it as children of God? We are reconciled. There are so many people who are still living in guilt. There are so many people who think God is angry with them. God is, is, is you know, written them off. God does not write off anybody. God is not mad at this world. As much as other people may think God is waiting to judge the world, that's not the heart of God. God is waiting to save the world. He's waiting to reconcile the world. And He wants us to play our part. You don't have to have guilt. You don't have to have condemnation in your heart. I want to add to that and say, even before you can ask God to forgive you, He has already provided forgiveness for you on the cross. You believe that? Even before you can think of being reconciled to God, He's already taken the initiative to make you reconciled to Him. Already done it. All He is wanting is our response. Here's an example in the Bible, a story that illustrates the whole message of reconciliation between a father and a son. In Luke chapter 15. Where the Bible talks about a father that had two sons. And some of you know that familiar story. But I want to draw your atten attention to something very significant. That the son goes up to his dad and says, Dad, I want my inheritance now. It's, taking, it's going to take a long time for you to die and get my inheritance. I want it now. The father sells the property, divides the share, takes the money and gives it to the younger son. The younger son goes off to a distant country, squanders all the money. As a result, his friends leave him and the only sensible thing he could do at that moment is find himself a job. Famine came to that place. He worked in a farm feeding pigs. And Jesus says in the story, he was so hungry that he would long for the pods that the pigs ate. And then it dawned on him that in his father's house there are many servants and there's plenty of food and lack nothing. He came to his senses and said, I've sinned against God and I've sinned against my father. 
all of us have been prodigal sons. All. Every human being has been prodigal sons. We've all walked away from our father. And that story was not just about an earthly father and a son. The story that Jesus was talking about is about a world that's turned its back upon the father who is represented as God. And as a result of being prodigal in our heart and turning away from God, this prodigal son says, I've sinned against God and I've sinned against my father. And he does something. He gets up from that place of despair. He gets up from that place of hopelessness. And if you find yourself like that, that this morning, it's time to arise. It's time to know in your heart. It's time to have a revelation that there is a God who is waiting for you. There is a Father in heaven that's longing to be reconciled with you. And that you don't have to sit with self-pity and condemnation in that place anymore. The son decides to act on his conviction. He gets him from that place and he begins to walk towards his father's house. The Bible says that the father saw his son coming from a distance. Chose to run and meet his son. That's how exactly God has been to you and me. He knows and he comes towards us. You know what the prodigal son says? I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Take me as a slave, like one of your other hired ones. Listen to me. The father never labeled him as unworthy. Isn't that right? Who labeled him? Who labeled him? Who? Who? Who's labeling you? Not God. We label ourselves. We disqualify ourselves. God's not judging you, but we judge ourselves. Like I say very often, some of us have this persecution complex. We, we criticize ourselves, we condemn ourselves so well that you don't need the devil around. We do a good job by ourselves. And God has not labeled you as a sinner. We label ourselves as sinners. We label ourselves as unworthy. And we bring that label to God like the prodigal son does every time. I'm unworthy to be your son. Treat me as a slave. And we carry a wrong mentality. But the father never responded to the son. He never replied to him. All that the father did was embrace the son. Now you know someone working in a pig sty. How, how the person will smell. At the most, I would have held my nose and shook his hands. A father, a loving father, God, represented in the story, embraces him. Four things the father did that he will do for you. He embraced him. Didn't mind the dirt, didn't mind the filthiness, didn't, didn't, didn't listen to this, his, his statement of being an unworthy son. He embraced him. And then he kissed him on his neck. Kissed him. Repentance means changing your mind about God. What does repentance mean? I want us all to say that. What does repentance mean? Can we say that one more time? If you have Jesus in your life, but still view God as angry and as a, as a judge and not loving, you have not fully understood the heart of God. You have not fully repented. Repentance is changing your view about God. Knowing that He's not an angry God. He's a long-suffering God. He's a God that loves unconditionally and accepts unconditionally. We need to have a shift in our mind when we view God. That's what the Bible says. The second thing that the father did, he put a robe, not just a robe, the best robe. Call for his service, get the best robe and put it on him. When you come to God, he clothes us with the gov government of his righteousness. 
That's what he does. He clothes us with his garment of righteousness. Not our righteousness. No matter how filthy we are, he covers us. He never exposes us. The Bible says the love of God covers a multitude of our sins. He clothes us. Jesus was telling a story that was so radical. A boy that was dishonoring to his parents according to the law would be stoned at, outside the, the, the city gate. And Jesus is turning that right around. He says, the father embraces him and puts the best robe on him. That was radical thinking. When you go to, by the law, the law will judge you and condemn you. You come to Jesus, he will love you and he will accept you. The second thing, the third thing that the father did, put the ring on his finger. Ring is a sign of belonging. You belong. And the father said, you always belong to this home. I never disowned you. I always owned you. You were my son as long as you were in my home. You were just a son as you were outside in a different and rebellious. He was still a son in the eyes of the father. And God looks at us like that. We're still his children. We're still redeemed by the blood of his son, Jesus. The fourth thing, he cut the calf and he celebrated. But this time, Jesus, God didn't cut a calf. He lay his son as a sacrifice so that we will be reconciled to God, that we will enjoy his peace and we will be back home again. So, so many of us strive. We strive for His blessing. We strive for our healing. We strive for our freedom. We don't realize. We're no longer slaves in His house. We are sons in His home. We belong to Him. And that's what reconciliation is all about. God is bringing us back into family. He's bringing us back into relationship with Him. Every one of those four things we can experience this morning. Our salvation is complete. Not when we repented. Repentance is only the beginning. Our salvation is complete when we understand the unconditional love of God. That's what completes our salvation. When we receive His forgiveness, that's what makes reconciliation meaningful, which leads to salvation. Receive. So many of us, we like to pray, we like to minister to the sick, but we have not embraced the ministry of reconciliation that God longs to use us for. God in you pleads for a reconciled world back to Him. Now this is the ministry of the Apostle Paul. I'm going to read a few verses in Acts chapter 26 verse 18. Look at what the Bible says here. God turned Saul on the way to Damascus and said this, commissioned him. To open their eyes. Now this is the ministry that God's giving us. Open spiritual eyes of people. We can't save anyone. We can't make anyone repent. But all we could do is share the love of God. Share the ministry of reconciliation. So that their spiritual eyes will be opened. In order to turn them from darkness to light. And from Satan and the power of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness. Say the word receive. Say it again receive. He didn't say ask for forgiveness, but receive for forgiveness. Look at me. God has on his banqueting table forgiveness laid out for every one of us. His love is laid out for every one of us. He's calling us to see and receive. What is he calling us to do? See and receive. If you see it, you can receive it. But if you don't see it, then you'll keep asking, God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. You will be filled with guilt. You will be filled with condemnation. Even though you pass five years of your life, you're still stuck in that place because we have not received. And the Apostle Paul says, that his mission was, open their eyes, spiritual eyes, that they may receive forgiveness. Forgiveness is something that you can experience it's not just a theological thing. You can experience the love and the forgiveness of God and feel forgiven because of what Jesus has already died. It's done. It's over. 
Then it goes on to say, may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. We're sanctified, we're set apart. We're forgiven people because we received it from God. Don't earn it. Don't have to work out hard for it. We all have to come to God, see his heart and receive his forgiveness. And this is what Paul commissions Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 verse 1 to 2. Look at the solemn words that the Bible uses. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Strong words. Command you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Verse 2. Preach the word. What is Paul charging them with? Preach the word. And if there's anything that God wants us to do, preach his word. And he goes on to say, be ready in season and out of season. Convince if you have to. Rebuke if you have to. Exhort if you have to. With all long suffering and teaching. Why? To see people reconcile back to God. This is charge. This is a command. And goes on to verse 5. But you be watchful in all things. And your afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. What's your ministry? What's your ministry? The ministry of reconciliation, which is the work of the evangelist. You may not be called to be an evangelist leading thousands to the Lord, but we are all called to do the work of an evangelist to see reconciliation happen in your family, in your neighborhood, wherever God has placed you. That is our heart. And we need to bring, bring that before God and say, God, I'm seeking you for the spiritual blessing. You swore that you will do it. I'm believing you for it and I'm trusting that you will open doors and you will give me the ability not only to enjoy reconciliation but to see others being reconciled with God. Thank you for listening to this message. To know more about us, please visit www.adonai-ministries.com 